So in our last lesson, uh, we looked at John's description of the Lord's death, burial, and resurrection. And we noticed that he spent uh, very little time describing the details of these things, focusing rather on the reaction of the various individuals to the event. So he doesn't describe you know, the nails going into the hands and all that, the scourging. He, he, he focuses on how people reacted to all of that. You know, Pilate, he, you know, we look at Pilate who condemned him. We look at the soldiers who tortured and mutilated his body and in so doing they fulfilled prophecy. You know, or not we do, but John you know, kind of looks at them. He looks at uh, Joseph and Nicodemus who buried him. And then Mary Magdalene who was the first disciple to discover the empty tomb after his resurrection. You know, he's looking at people, not events, not necessarily events, which is what he's done throughout the entire book. Right? The entire book is just a dialogue between Jesus and different individuals. And so that, that kind of style continues here. Uh, he looks at Peter and John who were the first apostles to see the evidence of the resurrection at the empty tomb and then finally once again uh, he uh, looks at uh, Mary Magdalene who returned to the tomb and was the first to actually see and speak to Jesus after the resurrection. So all of these John examines as he describes their varying degree of faith as they witness and are affected by Jesus in every stage of his death and burial and resurrection. Remember what I've said this whole book is about how do people react to Jesus, either with faith or without faith? And so he continues this very same thing in, in the very end. He, he doesn't describe at length the events, he describes how people were reacting to these events. And so when we left off in our last lesson, Mary was charged by the Lord to go tell the apostles of Jesus' resurrection, and she does do that. As we pick up John's gospel in chapter 20, verse 19, we're going to see how John describes Jesus' actual appearance and interaction with His apostles after the resurrection. Now the Bible records at least 11 appearances by Jesus after uh, His uh, resurrection. Uh, they're listed in the scriptures, uh, or rather they're listed and the scriptures are listed on your, um, uh, on your worksheets there. So the first appearance, of course, is to Mary Magdalene in Mark 16 and John 20. The next one, uh, appearance to the other women that were with her. We read about that in Matthew 28, Mark 16, Luke 24. The third appearance to Peter, Luke 24 and 1 Corinthians 15. The next one would be to the two disciples who were on the road to Emmaus, Luke 24. The fifth appearance uh, to the apostles without Thomas. Now we're going you know, to go over these, I'm just giving you the list right now. So appearance to apostles without Thomas, Mark 16, Luke 24 and John 20. Sixth appearance uh, to the apostles, but this time with Thomas in John chapter 20. The next one, he appears to the apostles by the Sea of Galilee in John chapter 21. We'll take a look at that when we get to that part of the of, of John's gospel. The seventh, the eighth appearance uh, to the apostles on the mountain uh, to give the Great Commission, Matthew 28 and Mark 16. The ninth one to the 500 and James, I believe that is the, the, same, uh, the same appearance, 1 Corinthians 15, 7. The tenth one, he appeared to the apostles at the Mount of His Ascension, Mark 16, Luke 24, Acts chapter 1, and then the eleventh one is a little offbeat, but of course he appeared to Paul the Apostles, uh, Paul the Apostle rather, after his resurrection. Some don't count that, but I mean that is an appearance that's actually listed, you know, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Now remember, these may not be the only ones, but these are the ones that are recorded. These are, you know, I think we have enough. You know, one would be enough. We have 10, we have 11. So John, in his final chapters, he only chooses to describe four of the 11 appearances, and then he makes a few summary statements to end his gospel. So let's go back, take a look at that. Jesus appears to the apostles in chapter 20. Now, John's already described Jesus' first appearance to Mary Magdalene, and now he switches the scene to the apostles. In the meantime, the Lord has appeared to the other women and privately to Peter. So let's pick the story up in uh, chapter 20, verse 19. 
So when it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and when the doors were shut where the disciples were, for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in their midst and said to them, Peace be with you. And when He had said this, He showed them both His hands and His side. The disciples then rejoiced when they saw the Lord. I want you to note that even if the apostles knew about the resurrection from the reports of the women, Peter and the, uh, Peter and the disciples from Emmaus, you know, they also told, you know, the, the disciples who came from Emmaus told the apostles about they had seen the Lord. Even though they have been told this, they're still afraid. They're still confused. They're still in hiding. They haven't busted out and said, hey, look at this. Wow, we've got reports that the Lord is... No, 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 no. They're still locked down. Okay. They feared being killed by the Jews the same way that their leader was. So you, know, you think, if he could be killed, the one who did the miracles, imagine what's going to happen to them if they show their face. So note also that Peter is not able to calm their fears, even with the news and the proof of Christ's resurrection. He hasn't kind of ascended to his kind of real leadership role. Jesus, of course, at this point, simply appears among them, no longer limited by human weakness. He demonstrates the power of his glorified state. And he gets them, or greets them rather, with a common greeting. But coming from him, it's a greeting that means so much more. So his appearance will truly bring peace to their troubled life. I mean, they're troubled, they're scared, they're in hiding, and he shows up among them and he says, you know, peace be with you. Whew. You know, I, I'd like to hear that if I'm afraid for my life and I'm locked somewhere. So they were concerned uh, that it is him and not just a ghost or some hallucination or a dream. And, and then he shows them what? He shows them the scars on his hands, the, the piercing on his side. So this is, notice, this is the first time that they rejoice. They didn't rejoice when the news was given to them by the other people concerning the resurrection. Now they rejoice. Now he's there. Now they, can, now they breathe easier. They begin to react uh, positively. Let's keep reading. So Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you as the Father has sent me, I also send you. And when He had said this, He breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, their sins have been forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they have been retained. So in these verses, Jesus does three important things. First, He commissions them on behalf of the Father to continue His work in calling all men to God. So just in case they weren't sure what their job was going to be, He reminds them. Number two, He gives them the Holy Spirit to dwell within them, thus fulfilling His promise to them in chapter 16. Now they had already been baptized to fulfill God's command through John, but now that Jesus is risen, they receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. After they begin to preach the gospel, those who respond will receive this same gift of the Holy Spirit from Jesus, but now they'll receive it in the waters of baptism. Acts chapter 2, of course, 38. And then finally, He grants them the authority to carry out the Great Commission. I mean, there's nothing secretive here and nothing mysterious about this authority. Through their preaching and teaching, sin will be forgiven or sin will be retained based on the response of the hearers. It's not going to be an arbitrary thing where the apostles have the power to go around and say, okay, you, your sins are forgiven, you, I don't like your face, your, your sins are not forgiven, you know, and so That's not the point. He's giving them the authority to preach the gospel and he's telling them through their preaching, sins will be forgiven for those who believe and respond, or sins will not be forgiven for those who reject it. That's the authority that they, that they have. So now we move on to the appearance to Thomas. Next appearance occurs about a week later to the apostles again, but this time with Thomas. So in verse 24 and 25 we read, but Thomas, one of the twelve, called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples were saying to him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see in his hands the imprint of the nails and put my finger into the place of the nails and put my hand into the side, I will not believe. So John explains Thomas' reluctance to believe. Now, his disbelief hasn't driven him to sin. His disbelief hasn't you know, driven him to abandon the other apostles. 
He merely sets conditions on God before he will completely accept the news of Christ's resurrection. You know, he's saying, hey, I hear what you're saying, you guys. You know, you've seen him, he's resurrected, he's talked to you, I hear you. But you know, I'm, you know, I did three years here and I believed and I need more proof now. And so what happens? He says, well, I'll believe it when I see it. How many of us have said that? You know? I'll believe it when I see it. And so you know, God takes him at his word. 26 to 29, he says, after eight days, his disciples were again inside and Thomas with them. Jesus came, the doors having been shut, and stood in their midst and said, once again, peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, reach here with your finger and see my hands and reach here with your hand and put it into my side. Do not be unbelieving, but believing. Thomas answered and said to him, my Lord and my God. And Jesus said to him, because you have seen me, have you believed? Blessed are they who did not see and yet believe. So Jesus appears again, provides the proof that Thomas required. He admonishes Thomas and he encourages him to believe. And Thomas shows his belief by declaring his faith and worshiping Jesus. Of course, this is another way of demonstrating our faith by worshiping the Lord. Not just by, you know, you're at work and somebody says, so do you go to church? And yes, I'm a Christian. That's one way, of obviously, to confess our faith. But when we get up and we're driving to church on Sunday or the church building in order to worship the Lord and so on, that's a way of demonstrating our faith. We're saying to the world, we believe. So in his response, the Lord admonishes Thomas because he refused to believe based on the right or uh, the sight and the witness of others. And he had witness of others. The women told him uh, that uh, the Lord had risen. Peter had told him uh, the Lord had risen. The disciples from Emmaus had told him, even the other apostles. But he wanted to see for himself. So while Jesus was with them, this was possible. And the Lord graciously granted Thomas's demand. I mean, uh, in this story, I see how kind the Lord is. You know, if it was me, I'd say, look, buddy, I've given you three years of miracles. Four different people that you trust have told you, you know, if you don't believe by now, well, that's me, that's not the Lord, obviously. So the Lord, you know, He suffers His weakness. He suffers His lack of belief and gives Him the proof that He needs. And He doesn't throw Him out as an apostle either. He doesn't say, well, listen, you know, you're not cut, you're not the right kind of guy that I want to be my apostle. He doesn't do that either. He simply admonishes him. However, in the future, he's reminding the apostles and us, in the future, faith is going to be based on the sight and the witness of other people. That's how we came to faith. We didn't see the resurrection. We don't know anyone who witnessed the resurrection. I mean, personally. So we have to believe like Thomas was supposed to believe. We believe based on the, the witness of other people the apostles and those 500 and those who wrote the gospels and so on and so forth. And Jesus pronounces a blessing on those people who would believe in this way, that's us. I always like the idea that I'm included personally in this passage. He's referring to me, not by name, but by group. I'm in the group that he talks about, and so are you. So Thomas was there, he saw, but the blessing that Jesus pronounces does not include him, only the people like us who have not seen, but yet we have believed. So, so John now, after this, he kind of summarizes and makes a conclusion here. Chapter 20, verse 30 and 31. He says, therefore many other signs Jesus also performed in the presence of His disciples, or the disciples, which are not written in this book, but these have been written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and believing you may have life in His name. So John ends his gospel, for all intents and purposes, it ends here. He ends it with a proclamation of faith from one who has seen the evidence before him. He's saying to his readers, look, I've seen all these things, and I've written them down so that you can, you can see them through my eyes as well. One last example of the cycle of faith that we've seen repeated over and over again in his gospel. So, this is his first closing. Therefore, it's a summary statement that describes what the purpose of his book was. Just in case you forgot why I'm writing this to you, he says, I'm reminding you once again, I've written all this down so that you can believe, you, know, you the, the reader. 
The things written in his book are only a portion of the miracles and the teaching and the events in the life of Jesus, but they have been recorded as a witness to bring the reader into the cycle of faith. So he talks to all the, you know, all the people that Jesus talks to in here. Remember I said it's, the book of John is just one long dialogue between Jesus and the Jews and Jesus and the disciples and Jesus and the Pharisees and Jesus and the lepers. And you know, Jesus, you know, it's just him talking to all these people and all these people either believing or not believing. So at the very end of the book, John turns the tables and now he's talking to the readers of the book. Your turn, he says. Your turn. Now Jesus is talking to you. How are you going to respond? So all the stories of faith or disbelief lead up to the asking the reader himself to decide if he or she will be counted among the believers or the disbelievers. You know, that, isn't that what preachers do? They go through their lesson and at the very end you know, they come home with a quote exhortation. The so what? I've told you all of this stuff, I've, I've preached to you all of this here, and now here's the money shot. Here's what I think you ought to do. Here's what the word is telling you to do. The exhortation, well this is the exhortation. All right, so now we move on to another interesting section. In chronological order, this next section would be the seventh time that Jesus appeared. So John selects this as his third example of Jesus' appearances. Now it's unusual that after his concluding and summary statement, John adds yet another description of Jesus' interaction with the apostles before his, um, uh, his uh, ascension. You know, think about it, he's already concluded, it's finished. The book could stop right there and it'd be plenty, but he keeps on going. Now some scholars say that this chapter was added by someone else at another time. Biblical research shows, however, that no copies of John's gospel have ever been found without the 21st chapter. So you can assume that somebody else wrote it, but the evidence says John wrote it. And also it means that it has always been in this format. So the gospel of John has always included chapter 21. Okay? So John then is the author of chapter 21, but the manner in which it was written may have varied from the first 20 chapters. We'll talk about this in a minute. So chapter 21 could be considered an epilogue. You know what an epilogue is? You know, the part that comes after the main story. If you're watching TV, you watch your, your favorite show, right? Let's say an hour show. And, uh, and then the, the story concludes, they caught the bad guy or whatever, you know. And then there's a commercial, right? And then after the commercial, there's usually another minute and a half of activity. You know, it keeps on going and they're back at the office or they're saying, well, that was a great case. And you know, an epilogue of what happened. Sometimes you have a book that tells the story. And at the end of the book, there's one more chapter that tells you what happened in the future to the characters that were in the story. Well, this here, chapter 21, it's an epilogue. He's told the story, he's made a conclusion. Here's an epilogue to what happened to some of the people that were involved in the story. It says, after these things, notice, after these things, the epilogue. After these things, Jesus manifested Himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias, and He manifested Himself in this way. So John sets the scene and the event that will take place. Note that Jesus appears in Jerusalem, in Galilee, and in between. He appears to women, to men, to individuals, to groups. He appears indoors, He appears outdoors, He appears at night, He appears in the daytime. He appears over a, a period of 40 days. Unlike other religious leaders or prophets, where there is just one appearance, and it's usually to just one person, and usually in a very secluded spot, in a cave. You know? How many of the modern day prophets say, well, you know, I, God spoke to me, really, where? Well, I was by myself. Okay, so no witnesses, that's correct. And where were you? I was in a cave. Oh, oh, good, good. And, 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 and what language? Oh, well, it's a language nobody but me understands. Really? Okay, I'm, I'm going to give up my life following that guy. So that's why it's significant that Jesus, His appearance is in so many ways. Night, day, men, women, groups, individuals, and so on and so forth. Okay? Indoors, outdoors. So we keep going, verse two and three. 
Simon Peter and Thomas called Didymus and Nathanael of Cana in Galilee and the sons of Zebedee and two others of his disciples were together. Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. And they said to him, we'll also come with you. So they went out and got into the boat that night and they caught nothing. So the apostles are still together, but they're waiting for the next step in their ministry. They've seen Jesus. They've received the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Peter, as is his custom, his character, he's agitated, he's impatient with all of this waiting. He just decides to do something. So he goes back to what is familiar. Isn't that what we do? We, we, we play to our strength. We go back to the things we know. They may have needed money or food because their supporters may have gone into hiding after the crucifixion. We know that different individuals supported Jesus and the apostles. They had to eat, they had to live. Maybe they lost their, quote, their support. <laughs> As a former missionary, I know what that's like. You lose your support sometimes. Whoop, you got to scramble and go back and find money to go out and preach. Well, maybe, maybe this was the reason they went, they went fishing. Who knows? So it's a familiar scene begins to develop as they fish all night, they don't catch anything. So let's keep reading. It says, but when the day was now breaking, Jesus stood on the beach, yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. So Jesus said to them, children, you do not have any fish, do you? They answered, no. And He said to them, cast the net on the right-hand side of the boat and you'll find a catch. So they cast and then they were not able to haul it in because of the great number of fish. So Jesus again, appears and calls out to them regarding their task and they respond to him by you know, trying the other side of the boat. Of course the miracle is instantaneous as a full catch is made to the other side of the boat. Let's keep reading. Seven, he says, therefore that disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it is the Lord. So when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put his outer garment on for he was stripped for work and threw himself into the sea. But the other disciples came in the little boat, for they were not far from the land, but about 100 yards away, dragging the net full of fish. So you know, think now about personalities, think now about human nature. Perhaps like Mary Magdalene, whose grief and anxiety kept her from recognizing the Lord. Perhaps Peter's focus on the task at hand prevents him from recognizing the Lord until John points him out. So Peter's enthusiasm can't wait for the boat, so he plunges into the water to make his way to shore, and the others follow. They don't want to lose the catch. You know, we're out here to fish, we're out here to make a living. <laughs> they, they stick with the fish. You know. Verse uh, nine, 9 to 11, it says, So when they got out of the, on land, they saw a charcoal fire already laid, and the fish placed on it, and bread. And Jesus said to them, Bring some of the fish which you've now caught. And Simon Peter went up and drew the net to the land full of large fish, 153, and although there were so many, the net was not torn. So they caught fish, but Jesus already had a fire going with fish and bread prepared for them. The better translation of what Jesus says to them is, before you eat with me, go take care of the fish you have caught. So they've caught a lot of fish, they're not yet sorted. Their breakfast is cooking, so Jesus tells them to take care of the catch. They do so, and after the smaller and inedible fish are thrown back, 153 fish are kept. And some people are always trying to figure out some sort of secret meaning to the 153 fish. Well, here's the secret. There is no secret. <laughs> There's no symbolism here. No symbolism in this number. John provides these small details to complete the vividness of the scene the very real and natural activity that was taking place in an extraordinary moment. It's like looking at a beautiful painting and, you see all, and then you look a little closer and you see all kinds of little details that the artist has put in. Well, all kinds of little, the number of fish, you know, I mean, it doesn't mean anything, doesn't change any of the meaning, it's just a small detail that adds to the realness of that scene. A regular fishing trip with a regular breakfast, with a regular group, except Jesus the resurrected Lord is present. In other words, the event is extraordinary, but it's not bizarre. You see what I'm saying? It's not like in a trance. Jesus wasn't floating above the, the fire and the fish didn't miraculously fall down from, you know, he was making breakfast. And said, no, you go ahead, take care of the fish, you know, you come. And so an extraordinary moment brought forth in a very natural scene. 
12 to 14, Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. None of the disciples ventured to question him, you know, who are you, knowing that it was the Lord. Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them and the fish likewise. This is now the third time that Jesus was manifested to the disciples after He was raised from the dead. So John continues his very matter-of-fact like description of a very special moment as the apostles sit quietly eating the food Jesus has prepared for them. They know who He is and how exceptional all of this is and John adds that this is Jesus' third appearance to them as a group. So we're keeping track. Now, John is the only gospel writer to describe all, of, all three of these appearances of Jesus to the apostles as a group without other people present, without Thomas, with Thomas, near the Sea of Galilee. Three, three appearances to the apostles just themselves with no other persons present. Verse 15, so when they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? And he said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you, he said to him. Uh, he said to him, tend my, ten my lambs. Verse 16, and he said to him again a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And he said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, shepherd my sheep. And he said to him a third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things, you know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, tend my sheep. Now, we know that Jesus has already appeared to Peter alone, but we don't have, and, and we see that in Luke 24 and 1 Corinthians 15, but we don't have any information about that. Not in John, that's for sure. Since Jesus has already included him among the faithful apostles when he told the women to tell the disciples and Peter, Mark 16, 7, we can surmise that Peter received forgiveness for his sin of denial uh, at that time. He was also with the apostles when Jesus appeared and gave them the Holy Spirit and authorized them to go into the world as Jesus was sent into the world in John 20. So we know He has the Spirit, He's received the commission along with the others, He's been forgiven. So this dialogue between them was recorded to publicly restore Him and confirm His apostleship and ministry as well as His repentance and His, um, his approval by the Lord. You know, Maybe he and the Lord know that he's been forgiven, he's received the Spirit, and so on and so forth. But the general world, the people at large, they don't know that. All they know is he was the chief apostle, he was the big talker, he was the one that said, I'll go with you anywhere, I'm ready to die with you, and he's the one that cut and run when, the, you know, uh, when Jesus was arrested. All they know about Peter, other people, the only thing they know about Peter is that he denied the Lord, that he was a coward. And so on an intimate basis, Jesus has brought him in and forgiven him and given him the spirit and included him as an apostle. But there needs to be something a little more public to help other people not have a stumbling block because of Peter's formal denial or former denial. So how does Jesus do this and John recording it? Well, he does it by asking three questions. Question number one, do you love me more than these? This is a reference to his former boasting self, you know, I'm ready to die for you. Remember he said that? A claim that his love was superior than the other apostles. These guys will follow you, but I, I'm ready to die for you. So now he says, do you love me, Peter? And in that question is another question that Peter understands, and it goes like this. Peter, is your love still greater than these? In other words, do you love me more than these love me, Peter? So Peter, humbled by his past failures, answers more in line with what is true. The Lord knows the extent of his love. Lord, you know I love you. In other words, you know how much I love you. <laughs> Not more than the other guys, you just, you know me. No, he no longer claims any more than what the Lord knows to be true. To this more honest and realistic response, Jesus gives him the commission of pastoral leadership. Now this doesn't make Peter the leader of the apostles. He's not to feed the other apostles. He's to lead and feed the flock, the believers, like the other apostles. If there's anybody out there that thinks that he does not qualify to be 
someone to preach and teach and so on and so forth, the Lord is giving him this mandate by saying, go and feed my sheep. Remember, the other apostles, they hadn't betrayed Jesus like he did. They didn't need to be restored to the apostolic role like he did. Yeah, they ran away, but his denial was so very public. All right, question number, question number two. Do you love me? Same question. This time, there's no comparison to the others, right? It's just, do you love me? After all that has happened, you know, the denials, do you really love me? You know, Peter's actions were not born of love, but they were made out of fear and self-preservation. So what does Peter answer? He answers in the same way, putting his confidence in Jesus and his ability to see Peter's heart, knowing that the love he does have is true. Lord, you know I love you. In other words, you know me. You know the extent of my love. Jesus builds on this to, the, to point Peter again to the flock, directing him to invest his love of Jesus into the, if you love me, then you need to love these others too, is what he's saying. In other words, this is how you will prove your love for me. Take care of my sheep. The first command redirects Peter to his task. The second one gives him the motivation for it. If you're going to feed my sheep, do it because you love me. Okay. Third question, Jesus asks, do you love me? Third time. Now Peter's anguish is based on the fact that this third question makes it abundantly clear the purpose for all these questions. If anybody who was there was wondering, why is he asking him this, this question? But by the time he asks the question the third time, they understand what's going on, and so does Peter. And that is to purge the three previous denials in a public way. In a public way, you denied me three times. In a public way, you're going to affirm your love for me three times. Peter left the circle of the apostleship with three categorical, uh, categorical denials of the Lord. And so the Lord reinstates him publicly with three affirmations of love and confidence that Jesus knows his heart. And so the Lord finishes again with an admonition to care even for the smallest and weakest of his flock. So now that Peter uh, knew about failure, now that Peter knows about weakness, now that he understands what it means to be totally dependent, now he is ready to care for these souls within the family of God. Once his pride has been kind of you know, whittled away by his failings, the fact that Jesus actually gives him something to do, and that makes you think. Think about your own life. I mean, think about your sins and think about your failings and so on and so forth. And realize, imagine, despite all of that, and I don't have to think about yours, I just have to think about my failings and my inadequacies and my sins that are very, very real. Imagine, he still manages to find something for me to do, to serve him. And this, this interaction with Peter brings that out clearly. A coward, a person who denied the Lord after he publicly said he would never do such a thing, you know, he really put himself out there. And yet Jesus, in his kindness, finds a way to use Peter. And I think that's the story for all of us. You know, we're broken people, we have broken lives, we've broken promises, we've, we've sinned, we've fallen down on the job, whatever. If we allow Him to, He restores us and He uses us in a very mighty way if we allow Him. All right, 18 to 24, let's finish it up. Truly, truly, I say to you, when you were younger, you used to gird yourself and walk wherever you wished. But when you grow old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will gird you and bring you where you do not wish to go. Now this he said, signifying by what kind of death he would glorify God, and when he had spoken this, he said to him, follow me. And Peter, turning around, saw the disciple whom Jesus loved following them, the one who also had leaned back on his bosom at the supper, and said, Lord, who is the one who betrays you? So Peter, seeing him, said to Jesus, Lord, what about this man? And Jesus said to him, if I want him to remain till I come, what is that to you? You follow me. Therefore this saying went out among the brethren that this disciple would not die. Yet Jesus did not say to him that he would not die, but only if I want him to remain until I come, what is that 
to you. This is the disciple who is testifying to these things and wrote these things and we know that his testimony is true. So these verses are self-explanatory, even meant to clear up confusion that existed before the book of John was written. And the book of John was written somewhere around 80, 85 AD. So Jesus prophesizes the type of death that Peter would experience and that would be a martyr's death. And we know historically how Peter died. You know, he had boasted that he was willing to die this way before he denied the Lord. Now Jesus says, you know what you said? You're willing to die for me? I'm going to fulfill that request. <laughs> you are going to die for me. And we know that Peter was martyred in Rome, 64 AD by, Ro uh, by Nero. He was crucified. They, went to, they were going to crucify him and he said he wasn't worthy to be crucified like his Lord, so they crucified him upside down. And they still crucified him. So now that he was reinstated, his future death for Christ would now glorify God. So Jesus bids uh, Peter to follow him away from the others and John is seen following behind. And Peter questions Jesus about John. What about this guy? What's going to happen to him? And Jesus answers that John's future is in his hands just like Peter's future is in the Lord's hands. And if the Lord wants him to remain alive until the second coming, that's out of Peter's hands. That's all he said. If I want him to stay till the end of the world, what's that to you? I'm the one that controls that, not you. And then John explains that the early disciples understood this to mean that John would definitely be alive until Jesus returns. And we know that John kind of lived a long time. I mean, much longer than what was average. In those days, lifespan, first century, 45 years maybe. So John lived well into old age. So you know, people may have thought that was true. So he corrects the error by saying that if Jesus wanted this to happen, it would. But this, is not, you know, this wasn't a promise. Jesus didn't promise this particular thing. And he identifies himself as the witness of the events and writer of the book to erase any doubts the reader might have. Now we get to the final summary number two. Summary number two in verse 25. He says, and there are also many other things which Jesus did, which if they were written in detail, I suppose that even the world itself would not contain the books that would be written. So John's second summary actually closes the book, but leaves open the question of Jesus' life and Jesus' work. There's enough here to base a decision of belief, but this is definitely not all there is. That's what John is saying. Actually, there's more that you don't know about than what was actually recorded. That's what he's saying. You, you think there's a lot here. Well, there's so much more. I've only you know, kind of, I've taken this piece here and put it down, the important stuff, the highlights. But if everything was written, the, the world wouldn't contain the books. And somehow that's true, right? Do you ever Google the name Jesus? <laughs> there are millions and millions and millions of references to Jesus. I mean, books, commentaries, it's, it's just incredible. You know, they, they say, you know, oh, religion's going down. People are not interested in religion. They're not interested in Jesus anymore. And then this, this uh, reporter, you know, Bill O'Reilly, writes a book, Killing Jesus. And all it is, if you're a Bible student, you read his book, and it's a good book, you know, and so on and so forth. But you know, 80% of it you already know because if you're a Bible student, you know, he adds a lot of information about the Roman Empire and what it was like in those days. So it was, it's really fascinating read. But what's interesting is in this day and age when people are saying, ah, nobody's interested in Jesus anymore. You know, O'Reilly writes a book called Killing Jesus, the number one selling book in the world. In the world. They, they, they can't print them fast enough. And so, the story of the life and the death and the burial and the resurrection of Christ is still something that draws people's interest. I say this simply to say this other thing. Let's not be afraid to share our faith because there are people out there who are hungry to know Jesus Christ. All right, we have one lesson left, kind of a recap. Uh, we'll do a couple of things that are fun at the end. We'll wrap it up next week. All right, thank you for your attention. That's it for today. <laughs>